Hello again everyone, this is Professor Casey, welcome back. Today we're discussing uh, the events adapted from Chapter 3 of David Emery Shy's America and Narrative History. And now that we've kind of gotten settled in a little bit to the colonial period, now we can look a little bit at just kind of the day-to-day -day activities in colonial society. Okay, and so this entire chapter deals primarily with just family roles, societal roles, uh, and kind of just how people got along or didn't in many cases in colonial society. So to give you a sense of the generic makeup of colonial society here, um, we know, of course, from the last chapter or two that most of the migration from Europe um, was due to a, a variety of different factors. Okay, We have religious dissent going on in Europe, um, religious wars for that matter. We had the English Civil War going on. Um, and I like to say that any time in history there is a, a major war or a conflict of some kind that ends up occurring, the aftermath of it is kind of like kicking a fire ant mound. Okay, when we live in Texas, I do anyway. So if you are familiar with fire ants, if you kick a fire ant mound, of course, the ants go absolutely everywhere. Okay, they, they just spread in all different directions. They scramble. And that's essentially what's going on here in uh, Europe, right? The conflict is coming to a head, coming to a close, and people are gradually beginning to jump ship here, right? They're running, getting away as far away and as fast away as they can. Um, when it comes to people actually arriving in the colonies, as we've already established, especially in the last chapter, um, this is a dangerous prospect. Okay? Going to the colonies was not a guarantee, initially anyway, of a better way of life. Okay? Quite often, it was fraught with more dangers than if you just stayed where you were. Okay? Um, to give you a statistic here, the average death rate was about 50% in the first few years of colonization in the New World. Okay? There were so many factors working against the colonists, um, everything from disease to starvation, dying of exposure, um, native attacks, uh, animal attacks, you name it. Okay? So there's all kinds of different things that are uh, potential pitfalls here. Um, after the first few years, though, the population doubles about every five years. Okay, so once people finally are able to set down roots, um, the population grows exponentially. Okay, people are actually becoming more and more self sustaining, and the numbers grow and grow and grow and grow. Okay, not only from people still coming to the new world, but also people who are having families and children of their own several generations down. Okay, and the land itself, of course, as we know. Um, is plentiful, right? There's plenty of it to be had, but of course, as we also know, the Native Americans live there, okay? So this is something where the, um, the, the Europeans look at this as land that has been untouched, okay? That doesn't necessarily belong to anybody that they can just claim for themselves without any repercussions, and that's really not the case, okay? Um, while the Native Americans don't have the same uh, system of belief when it comes to um, you know, property ownership or land ownership, um, the Native Americans and the land are still part of one another, okay? It is still part of their culture, part of their society, and their belief system, okay? So um, it's uh, still something that is, again, an additional pitfall to all this. And when the land can be purchased from Native Americans, when Natives can either be talked into it, tricked into it, whatever the case may be, it goes for fairly cheap, okay? So the, the Europeans have a distinct advantage over the Natives in this regard. Um, and, of course, when it comes to um, any kind of hired help, okay, laborers tend to be very scarce because most of the people who come to the New World don't really know what they're doing. Okay? Um, just like we saw with Jamestown, were it not for John Smith, the people of Jamestown would likely have starved because none of them had any farming experience. So actually getting someone who is experienced as a laborer who can actually help provide uh, a service for the community and educate people is kind of a rare find, okay? And most of those people were expensive and valuable, okay? Um, they would uh, probably not necessarily want to go to the New World. They would be of more value in Europe where society is already well established. And when it comes to the population boom, especially, a lot of this, again, has to do with the fact that colonial settlers had very, very large families. Okay, and part of that has to do with the fact that child mortality was extremely high. Okay, this is again far before any kind of modern advancements in medicine. Um, there were really no official doctors necessarily to speak of. You had physicians at the time who had very, very limited knowledge, and some of it was backed by 
uh, believes in magic, right? Believes in folk healing remedies, some of which still have validity even today, but um, again, very, very limited in terms of what can actually be done. So uh, quite often mothers would die in childbirth. Quite often children would not live past infancy, whether through, again, starvation, illness, the cold, whatever it happens to be. Okay. Average age for a settler in 1790 was about 16 as well. Okay, So these are very, very young people. And again, looking at a 16-year-old today, right? Imagine sending them to a new world to, you know, start life brand new. Again, it's it's kind of unthinkable, right? Children or you know, young teenagers from any generation are, are viewed as not necessarily being able to completely take care of themselves and thrive necessarily. Okay, so this is uh, even still people were had to do a lot more from a younger age back then, but it's still a challenge. Okay. The average marriage age for most women living in the colonies is about the age of 20. Okay, so uh, if you are, you know, getting into a young adulthood, if you're getting into your teenage years, chances are uh, your parents are already looking for someone to, um, to, you know, promise you to. Okay, uh, and quite often the parents would act as matchmakers here. Um, in Europe, the age is a little bit higher, 25 to 26, because the population was so dense, right? And it would be uh, far easier for someone to find, uh, you know, someone a little bit later in life, right? There was there were more choices, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, and as startling as this may seem, uh, again, because you know, people in the colonies had such large families. It's guessed on average that a married woman would have a child every two to three years until menopause, okay? And that's massive when it comes to the sheer number of people. And remember, not all of these children would survive. In fact, quite a few of them did not, okay? Um, so, I mean, again, as startling as this number is, you could potentially have a family with upwards of 20 children. Uh, and I mean, you know, two or three children today is a is a pretty high number, okay, given how densely populated our world is. But back then, uh, I mean, you, you had to do it simply to um, ensure the survival of your family, to ensure that if you had, um, you know, a, a, an agrarian uh, lifestyle or something, you would have help, <laughs> okay? You're, you're literally breeding employees, so to speak, okay? So uh, again, seems like a startling thing, but this is, again, still before any kind of uh, major contraception was available as well. Uh, and of course, the belief systems that were pretty firmly in place would have said no to it anyway. Okay, so um, you know, contraception has been around for, in one form or another, for several thousands of years, but um, it would have been looked on very, very disfavorably during this time period and bordering on witchcraft in some cases. Um, and again, as I said before, childbirth is an extremely risky event, okay? 25 to 50% of women uh, end up dying during childbirth just because of how unsanitary the conditions are. I mean, most people during this time period did not bathe on a regular basis. Um, I mean, just to give you an example, Queen Elizabeth, uh, I believe, was said to have bathed once a year and believed that that was too much. Okay, so as, as disgusting as that sounds, right, um, you can imagine that, um, you know, a, a common individual, uh, a peasant, uh, a, a freeman probably didn't even bathe all that much. Okay, so it's a, it's pretty, pretty nasty in terms of the, the conditions. And as you can imagine, this breeds disease, right? It breeds infection, uh, all, all kinds of horrible things. And again, about 25% of all babies end up dying in infancy, primarily due to disease. Okay, because again, there are uh, not really any sanitary conditions. The children are not being washed regularly. They're not being um, cared for in the sense that we would take care of a child in the modern sense. I mean, this would be, uh, you know, many of the practices might border on neglect in modern uh, view. Now, as to the role of women in the colonies, this chapter deals quite a bit with, uh, with women's roles. Um, as we've already established in the last chapter, too, the English colonies in particular have a much larger number of women than the Spanish and the French colonies do. And again, a lot of this has to do simply with the demographics and the goals of what these colonies are setting out to do. Okay? The Spanish and the French are really looking to... Um, it, when they do decide to colonize, that is, they're really looking for a way to establish a, a trading post and or a way to um, harness raw materials of some kind. Again, whether it be gold, timber, fur, whatever it happens to be. 
So they typically would send single men into these particular situations um, to work, again, just as workers in, in some regard, right? Whether they're soldiers or priests or fur trappers or what. But when it comes to the English colonies, again, we know that they're setting out to establish a permanent colony. And so many of them end up bringing their entire families. And again, in many instances, um, the colonies themselves are set up by um, large groups of families. Again, many times church congregations, okay? So you might have two or three or, you know, uh, usually no more than three generations living under one single roof. And you might have an extended family or something living nearby, okay? Um, and of course, this is a very, very patriarchal system. Okay? And again, looking at this in hindsight, it violates quite a few different uh, social mores that we see in modern society. Again, um, the uh, first wave feminism doesn't really even make uh, a real appearance until we get well into the middle and even the early portion really of the 19th century. Okay, so we're still quite a ways away from women being able to speak up and actually have more independence, more um, autonomy in this particular case. Okay, most women living in a colonial society uh, existed uh, at the whims of their husbands, at the whims of their fathers, um, the, the local priest, whatever the case may be, and were typically treated as second class citizens at best. Okay. They were expected to obey slash serve their husbands. Okay, so um, typically a, a woman was not uh, considered to be the, the head or even the equal in a, in a household. It was the father or the husband or whatever that would be the head. Okay, and the woman would act as his help mate, right, is kind of the way that biblical precedent, which a lot of these societies tried to use as the basis for their, um, for their way of life, was the way that it was set up. Okay. They were there to you know, do whatever their husbands needed done, to nurture and take care of the children, and to maintain the household while the men were away working in one regard or another. And of course, we see this being challenged again time and time again throughout the 20th century and well into the 21st, of course. Um, not to excuse it by any means during this time period. I mean, it's uh, the treatment of many women was was quite horrible. Okay? We, we don't know of many specific cases because um, women had few rights to even bring this to, uh, to a court, right? If they were being abused by their husbands, in very rare instances, a woman would be allowed to divorce only if her husband was a, a real villain, right? If he was, ab you know, absolutely harming her on a regular basis and the entire village knew about it, if he was a drunkard, you know, something like that, then it would go a little bit more in the favor of the woman. But in, in many instances, um, you know, domestic violence, among other things, is typically kept very, very quiet. Okay, so uh, we know very little about it in that regard. Uh, when it comes to the rights of women or the lack thereof, uh, we know these few things. We know that most women in this particular situation, regardless of their social class, uh, would not be able to vote for one thing, again, um, voting rights for women in most instances doesn't even occur until well into the middle or even the late 19th century at the earliest. Okay? Of course, here in America, it doesn't happen until 1920. Okay? We're, we're only 100 years out from women having the right to vote, as shameful as it is. Uh, women also cannot hold any kind of office. Again, this is another thing that doesn't really get challenged until we see the first wave of feminism come through. Most women are not even able to attend schools or colleges, okay? And this gradually begins to weaken more over time. We see this actually begin to weaken slightly once we get into um, the 18th centuries. In some rare cases, women might be educated via private tutors. Um, actual colleges and universities don't really start accepting women uh, in, in many, if not most cases, until the 19th century. Okay? So again, most of the modern um, rights that women have you know, whether in America or elsewhere, don't really start to exist for another uh, two or three hundred years from this point. Women, again, in most cases cannot bring lawsuits unless in rare instances it involves really severe domestic abuse that cannot be hidden. Okay, and again, um, there, there are way too many um, laws at this point in time that protected abusive husbands from being prosecuted. Um, again, it was a very rigged system by today's standards. Um, and women couldn't bring a lawsuit for any kind of necessary civil suit, okay? Um, and this is part of the reason why so many women in particular were targeted for witchcraft accusations during the time period. Um, it was way too easy because women had so few rights they weren't able to defend themselves, right? They weren't allowed to necessarily have 
um, uh, an attorney, a solicitor of any kind to advocate on their behalf, right? They only had their own word against the word of whoever it is that's charging them with something, okay? So it was, uh, women were essentially sitting ducks in many instances, um, and unless they had just an absolutely unimpeachable reputation, okay, which is a very um, difficult thing to maintain, even for the best of people during this time. Most women also could not sign contracts, okay? So when it comes to property ownership, when it comes to signing the deed on uh, land or on a home or a business, whatever the case may be, uh, typically they would have to have the husband do it, okay? The husband would be the one who would have property ownership, business ownership of something, um, and uh, even if it's on the behalf of the woman, and even if it's a, a wealthy family or a wealthy individual, okay? Um, money didn't necessarily grant you any kind of benefits if you were a woman, okay? You would still have to um, operate within society's norms for the time. And women, in most cases, again, were not able to become ministers, okay? 99% of the religious denominations during this time period still held to the belief that women were uh, supposed to remain quiet and subservient around men, um, especially in the, the New England colonies where the Puritans and the Congregationalists held sway. Uh, women were treated horribly in many of these instances just for speaking their minds. Uh, again, we saw the case study of Anne Hutchinson in the last chapter where uh, she was accused of blasphemy, convicted, and she and her entire family were banished to be killed and or eaten by animals in the wilderness. Okay, So, I mean, as extreme as some of these things may sound, uh, it was uh, typical operating procedures here, okay? And again, not excusing it by any sense of the, of the imagination. Um, the only real denomination that allowed women to have a voice, again, were the Quakers, okay? And women in that case were not even allowed to take on an official title of a minister, right? You still had an official male minister, but you might be able to... Um, allow some kind of like a women's ministry or have a, a woman be a guest speaker or be able to, you know, receive some kind of, uh, you know, divine revelation of some sort, again, because the Quakers believed in equality among the sexes in that regard anyway. So, again, Quakers would be uh, one of the only groups, if you're looking for uh, any kind of social or gender equality in, in colonial times, it's one of the only groups you would be able to find it in. And again, as I've said before, time and time again, divorce is really only granted in uh, exceedingly, quote unquote, cruel and barbarous treatment or abandonment. OK, if your husband up and leaves you and especially if you have children, OK, um, then you can you know, legally file for divorce. Okay? If your husband disappears um, and, and doesn't come back. Right. We, you might not know what happened to him. Right. He could be killed or anything like that. Um, or he could have just run off. And again, cruel and barbarous treatment, um, you could have someone who, you know, again, is, uh, you know, consistently and violently abusive, okay, and this can be taken to extreme extents, um, but again, this is really the only uh, sphere of rights that women had during the time. And when it comes to divorce, this is the other thing that is, um, again, horrifying by modern standards when it comes to domestic abuse. Um, typically, the male is the one who is engaging in this abuse, right? Not in all cases, but in many, if not most cases. Um, then in this case, the father would always get custody of the children, whether or not he is the one engaging in the monstrous treatment. Okay? So again, even if you do manage to get away from an abusive husband, you don't always have uh, the safety of your children guaranteed either. Now, continuing to talk a little bit about the role of women during this time period, um, the book goes into a, uh, you know, a rather drawn out section about what it refers to as, quote unquote, women's work. OK, this is the uh, the domestic sphere that women would operate within uh, in colonial society. Right. Whatever their responsibilities were on a daily basis. Um, and the term women's work really just refers to any activities done within the household, within the garden, if there and within the fields, if there are any. Okay, so again, uh, most people living in any kind of colonial society at this point, this is still before major cities have been uh, constructed. Okay, so there's not really an urban lifestyle to speak of. It's still quite rural, and just about everybody works in an agrarian lifestyle. Okay, so people are really engaging in planting and farming, um, and most women are kind of forced into this particular 
situation to work as equals in the, in the sense that they have to do manual labor in the same case as men, but again, with very, very fewer rights. Uh, most unmarried women, if they are, you know, young women into their teenage years, or even if they are uh, well into marrying age, quite often they end up working for other families. Okay? So you might have uh, a young woman who has been sent off once she reaches uh, maturity, right, once she reaches roughly um, her early teenage years, to work for another family as a servant of some kind, right, to work as a laundress, to take care of children, that sort of thing. Um, and again, childcare or yard and spending are the most, most common activities which young women end up engaging in here. Um, this is where we get the idea of the, uh, the alleged spinster, right? right? Someone who is put in a position where that's all they do all day long is spin yarn, right? From wool or from something along those lines to be made into a cloth of some point, right? And, you know, if a, if a woman never marries, right? She's referred to in this regard rather derogatorily anyway, as an old spinster, because that's essentially all her life is encompassed with. And again, childcare uh, is usually something that is being sought after quite regularly because of people are having so many children. Some women do get the opportunity to apprentice in an actual discipline. And this seems like a very rare instance for the time period because it uh, grants women some measure of um, agency. Right, gives them the ability to gain some in level of independence and to be able to make money on their own accord. Okay? So um, if there is an opportunity with the, to apprentice with a local artisan, if a woman is granted the opportunity to do so, right, um, you might find a, a young woman serving as a silversmith apprentice uh, in a blacksmith um, place, right, making horseshoes, uh, wagon wheels, whatever the case may be. Uh, a cobbler, right, a shoemaker, a sail maker, if it's on a coastal city, uh, a shopkeeper, a mill owner, right? There are opportunities for commercial enterprises for young women, uh, more so in the colonies than there might be back in Europe. Okay, so this is uh, one possibility that does exist in the colonies that is um, relatively groundbreaking for the time. And some manage to actually become proprietors later on in life, right? They do actually have full ownership of a business of some kind. And typically, these are women who are widows, okay? They might have had a husband who died uh, somewhere along the line and has uh, left an inheritance to go along with the woman. And if a woman finds the opportunity to actually um, go into business for herself, if she is trained in a certain discipline, then she might actually meet with some success, okay? Um, but um, there's still plenty of uh, mistrust and, um, uh, you know, misjudgment, I guess is the best way to put it, really, uh, when it comes to a male-dominated society. And, um, you know, looking at a woman who is successful uh, could be viewed as a potential threat to a lot of the men living during the time period, as horrible as it sounds. Uh, most of the proprietary situations that a, a, a widow might find herself in is maybe running a laundry of some kind, perhaps a bakery, um, right, a silver shop, right, something along those lines, right, selling a good of some kind. Um, and typically, when it comes to a woman who is married or is perhaps a young woman uh, who is not married, most of the time, the proceeds, if they have a, a living male um representative, I guess is the best way I can put it, then the proceeds typically go to that man. So if you have, um, you know, if you have a, a husband, all the money goes to the husband. If you have a, a father, then the money goes to the father and not to you. Okay, so again, it's, it's a circumvention of the rights of women. The women are still doing all the work, and they, you know, might have the pay set aside, and the father or the husband might be able to do whatever he wants with it. So again, it's, it's, it's infuriating in, in modern terms to think that something like this would be allowed to happen. But this was, again, the exception or the accepted method for the time. Um, when it comes to women living in towns and cities, once we start to see major cities being constructed, and again, most of these are typically coastal cities, okay? uh, cities that have to do with uh, large scale trade overseas, uh, maritime economies and so forth, um, town and city women typically have more uh, uh, varieties when it comes to opportunities like this. And this is where you might see uh, more opportunities for apprenticeship, 
okay? Because uh, typically a small community in a rural setting wouldn't have a silversmith, right? They might have a blacksmith, but um, you wouldn't see uh, a whole lot of specialty materials being made, okay? Um, but by and large, again, still the common uh, pigeonholed identity here of women who would comb, spin, wool, and weave, and bleach wool of some kind, right? Process it somehow to be made into cloth. Um, knit linen and or cotton, right, to, to actually turn it into cloth, okay? Um, work as a seamstress to hem sheets, to piece quilts together, uh, making candles and soap, of course, is another uh, potential opportunity here as well, right? If you ever go to um, any of the uh, colonial um, uh, reenactments, uh, villages or something that exists, and they're kind of peppered all over the country, you'll see these types of um, events actually occurring before your eyes, right? You get an opportunity sometimes to go in and try to make soap yourself, to try to learn how to make candles, and to see how difficult it actually was. And of course, doing menial tasks, right? Mopping floors and washing clothing. Again, women were kind of relegated to these positions, and um, as much as it uh, is you know, painful to say, this type of identity didn't go away really until we get to the 20th century in most cases. When it comes to women living on farms, though, life is a little bit more difficult. Okay? Um, again, you still have menial tasks, but most of it has to do with manual labor and it takes most of the day to actually accomplish. Okay. Uh, the, the typical schedule for a woman living on a farm, especially if you were a wife during the period, would be to wake before anyone else does and build fires and prepare breakfast by sunrise. Okay, and it's no small task in and of itself. Okay, um, haul water from a nearby river or creek or well or stream. Right, if you are living near a body of water. Feed and water the livestock if you have any, right? Typically, if you live on a farm during this period, you have some kind of livestock, whether it's goats or sheep, uh, you might have pigs, cattle and a horse if you have a little bit more money. Milk cows, churn butter and tend a garden if you have one. Again, typically you would have a garden to feed your family and most of the major crops that you have growing out in the field, right, would typically be what uh, would be sold at market for some sort of money. If you're a woman, you prepare all the meals, okay? It's typically uh, no instance for a man to do this unless he just happens to live by himself, which would be a rare instance. Of course, you play and entertain the children. Uh, you prepare them for bed once the day is through. Clean the kitchen after everyone the last one to go to bed, okay? Uh, so again, it's, it's a, a full day's work every single day for a woman, um, not really any opportunity for a break until maybe after everyone has gone to bed. If you know how to read, you might sit up and read a Bible. Okay. Um, when it comes to the rest of it, uh, uh, in the kitchen sphere, that is at least, um, English meals in terms of what would actually be served is some kind of a boiled or a broiled meat of some sort. Okay? And typically this would be wild game. Okay. Venison uh, was typically the most common one, of course, because deer are, uh, are, are still pl plentiful during this time period. Um, occasionally, uh, livestock would be slaughtered, so you might get mutton, which is sheep, uh, beef, of course, which is cattle, pork, pigs, that sort of thing. Um, and the meats would typically be combined with uh, some sort of vegetables from the garden, okay, uh, along with butter, if there any, is any that's been churned, and salt to be put into a stew pot. Uh, when it comes to desserts, puddings were typically the most common thing, um, and uh, puddings during the time period were not exactly like, um, you know, jello pudding like you would see today, or snack pack or anything, a little bit different, okay, the consistency would have been thicker, um, it would have been made perhaps from molasses or something else, um, sugar in its process form didn't really exist for probably about another 100 years, 150 years. Um, beer was actually the most popular drink, and even for children, yes, during this period. Um, and the reason for that is because water during this time period was often extremely unsanitary, okay? Um, well back into the Middle Ages, beer became extremely popular because the fermentation process typically would uh, get rid of any impurities in the water, okay? If you tried to drink uh, fresh spring water, uh, during this point in time, there is no way to really process it or distill it, okay? So um, the most common dangers, of course, are some kind of bacteria that could be in the water. 
Um, if you're getting water, for instance, from a pond or from a lake, um, the water would probably not be safe to drink because uh, quite often beavers would be the problem. And beaver feces actually contains a bacterium that if ingested by humans will make them very sick and uh, could potentially be fatal over time. It could breed uh, something along the lines of dysentery, E. coli poisoning, that sort of thing, salmonella, right? Things that people didn't recognize as actually existing during this point in time, okay? They only knew that um, you could get sick from it. So, yes, beer was probably the, the most common thing that people drank on a regular basis, everyone in the family, children included, okay? Um, and, you know, whether the beer was actually as, um, you know, high in alcoholic content as we know it to be today, you know, in some cases it might be, okay? So children might have uh, only, you know, a small glass of it or something along those lines. Sounds unimaginable to give a child a beer today, but... Um, again, in many cases, in many states, it is actually legal to do that if you are a parent. Um, otherwise, children might drink a glass of milk. Okay? That might be the only other potentially sanitary drink for them to have. Um, cooking over a, an open fireplace, like what you see in the background here, it's kind of faded out, um, was occasionally a dangerous uh, concept because the fire that would be built would have to be hot enough and high enough to be able to cook something in a pot. Okay? Um, and, of course, this could uh, lead to potential disaster, okay? People could uh, have an accident and be burned somehow. Uh, you might have a, a cord of wood that uh, pops and, you know, sends embers into the house, could catch the house on fire. Um, you know, people could spill hot grease on, on the fire and end up causing an even bigger conflagration. Could be all kinds of things. Um, the... Uh, the opportunities when it comes to living in cities for women as well, um, if a woman is not able to gain uh, gainful employment, uh, the only other alternative uh, that is also a very lucrative one in this case is prostitution. Okay? Um, and if you are a widow, especially during this point in time, and you end up inheriting a certain sum of money, um, you might go into the prostitution business and becoming the, um, the owner of a brothel, a madam of some kind, okay? Uh, someone who gains cut from each one of the clients, okay? And ends up, um, you know, making a, a decent amount of money that way, okay? And again, typically, uh, prostitution and brothels were only uh, more commonplace in major cities, okay? This would be relatively unheard of in a, in a village setting, uh, typically because villages were, were typically set up as a, a religious community. Okay? So obviously a woman would be hunted down, shamed, and so forth for something like this in that setting. Uh, port cities especially were common for brothels because you had sailors coming over from uh, from overseas, right? They you know bring over the um, stuff that they're selling, they sell it at market, they have a little bit of money, they have free time, go to a brothel. Um, and women who are actually convicted of prostitution, whether in a village or in a, a port city, right, if, uh, if they are trying to operate under the radar, which they typically were, um, they would be um, publicly revealed and whipped, okay, would actually be shamed and humiliated, and uh, would probably end up having to leave and go to another location after that. Um, women who were enslaved during this time period, okay, and when I say women enslaved here, typically we're talking about um, instances where they are perhaps Native American women, and this is still the early ages of African slavery existing in the Americas. Um, in some rare instances, enslaved women could try to seek compensation if an owner expected sexual favors from them, okay, um, and this eventually gets um, you know, brushed under the rug, especially once we get into the 19th century when uh, when African slavery becomes much more commonplace in the South. Um, too many things are turned a blind eye to, okay, or ignored uh, to where, you know, women and men have, um, you know, have instances where they're violated in many ways. And, uh, and the law and the courts are not willing to even entertain it, to even look at it. But in early instances, um, because the population was so small, it was easier to, to bring a case like that uh, to court and have it considered. Um, again, when it comes to women's jobs in towns and in cities, um, some of them could even be elevated to the level of a doctor. Okay? Living in a small village, if you were a woman who had knowledge of uh, 
you know, herbology or of traditional folk medicine or something, you might be, uh, depending on the society, depending on the community and the colony you live in, you could alternatively be viewed as a, a, a wise or a cunning woman, someone who, you know, was looked to for advice. Perhaps you might perform some kind of divination. Um, but in many instances, this would have been actively viewed as witchcraft. So in a setting like the Massachusetts Bay Colony, as we'll see here shortly, uh, or in most places in New England where the Puritans in particular held sway, this would have been something that no one would have wanted to, um, to do. Okay? If, if you had these, this knowledge and these abilities, um, doing it in the Massachusetts Bay Colony or in particular a Puritan or Congregationalist sector would have been a very bad idea, okay, because it would have gotten you a witchcraft charge very, very quickly. Okay. Um, and in towns, of course, this is still the, the point in time where the printing press has just recently been invented, okay, so some pamphlets, uh, some books, and so forth are starting to actually come about, okay, we have the first Bibles, of course, with the Gutenberg Press, um, Gutenberg Bible actually comes out, I think, back in the 1500s, so it's only been out for maybe about 100 years by this point. Um, so books are starting to become more popular. Newspapers are starting to gradually uh, start to appear here and there. Uh, becoming an upholsterer, of course, if you're upholstering furniture of some sort. Painter, perhaps, if you are an artisan and you are able to, you know, do family portraits for people, uh, something along those lines, you might be able to find some kind of patronage in, in a town. And of course, being a, an artisan who works with their hands in, uh, in silver is something that's very valuable. Okay? Uh, you might be able to make, um, you know, ornaments, you might be able to make, um, you know, jewelry or uh, silverware or something along those lines. Um, again, silver, you'd have to have the raw materials to do it, though, and uh, mining prospects were still kind of in their very, very early stages in the new world. Now, women's role when it comes to religion and its relationship with women uh, is a very, very tenuous one indeed, okay, uh, especially in the colonies. Uh, as we've already established, women had very few rights when it comes to just about anything. When it comes to religion in particular, uh, women are often the target of religious persecution. Okay? Uh, again, the Quakers are the only group that we know of that allowed women to preach openly and hold some kind of church office. Okay? They might be able to hold a position as a church elder, as a deacon of sorts, um, but uh, that was really about it. Okay? All other denominations typically uh, adhered to, I believe it's a, a verse of scripture that comes from uh, part of the New Testament, I believe it's one of the books of Timothy, I forget which, that basically states a woman is supposed to remain silent in the temple and not speak up. Okay? So this was one of the only instances, again, where that was ignored. Puritanism in particular was extremely uh, stringent about this okay? and um, engaged in some very medieval practices when it came to preventing women from preaching. Okay? If a woman attempted to speak out in public in a Puritan society in particular, um, they might be forced to wear a device like what you see in the two images here, okay? something that is referred to as a scold's bridle. Okay? And this is, again, a, a means of publicly shaming a woman. And um, for, again, uh, again, it comes across as extremely medieval and extremely cruel. Okay? It's a form of torture, essentially. And what it looks like, in case you can't tell, is it looks something like a, a bird cage, a helmet of some sort, uh, a, a wire or metal or iron uh, frame that would go and fit over a woman's head like a mask. And the device that you see at the top right here, you see kind of a, a, a see-through image of it here, is there is a, a thing that looks like a tongue depressor. That's exactly what it is. It's a, a device that fits into the woman's mouth and literally holds her tongue down. Okay. Uh, this would then be locked at the back of her head, and as you see here in the picture, she might even have her hands tied behind her back. And she would be forced to walk around all day, not being able to eat or drink or speak, really, with this on her face. Okay, So, I mean, this is, uh, again, something that would be viewed as extremely cruel, extremely horrible, and you would, you know, prosecute someone for doing this to someone today, but the law would be the one actually doing this to someone in the colonies. Okay, so uh, if you're a woman living in the colonies and you expect equality, 
steer clear of the Puritans, <laughs> okay? They, they were not out for that, okay? So uh, a woman like Anne Hutchinson in particular in the Massachusetts Bay Colony might have had to deal with something like this, might have had to wear this, okay? Um, black women, when they did exist in colonial settings, uh, typically chose to retain native religions, okay? And this would have been something that would have had to have been done in uh, absolute secrecy, okay? Um, quite often because these practices would have been viewed as witchcraft, as, again, as we will see uh, here very shortly, we'll see specific examples of this. Um, but native religions from, uh, from African countries, from the Caribbean, and so forth, actually held women in very high regard, okay? Uh, a lot of indigenous uh, religions actually held women to be uh, priestesses, gave them quite a bit of agency. Uh, and so, uh, unsurprisingly, given the alternative of the, the various domineering forms of Christianity at the time, many slave women at the time period would have chosen to keep their own religions, if for nothing else, because it was familiar to them. Um, and quite often, um, blacks during this time period were excluded from church membership uh, because uh, the people at the time, the, the white slave owners, actually knew that these people would realize that they're being held in captivity. Okay? They would have uh, eventually drawn and eventually do draw parallels between their own situation uh, and you know, the situation in, including the Israelites, right? the, the narrative of the Exodus is something that is uh, constantly looked to, especially during the civil rights era, as a, as a very direct parallel. Okay? So this is um, something where white slave owners knew that this particular situation was um, you know, immoral, okay? and they chose to exercise it anyway. Okay? Um, only reason that they justified it is because, uh, again, biblical precedent. Okay? Typically in Old Testament situations, um, there, there was quite a bit of precedent, especially considering the laws of Moses about how to treat slaves and so forth. And even in some cases in the New Testament, slavery was still something that was practiced and was given, you know, guidelines in, in the New Testament for that, okay? So um, people at this point in time, uh, they might not have known how to read, right, the Bible, but they would have been taught this by someone who did, okay? So many people were kept actively in ignorance um, because of the fears of emancipation actually occurring. Um, one of the most common forms of uh, indigenous practice that would have been used is something that's referred to as obeah. Uh, and again, this is a, a form of shamanism that is considered to be Afro-Caribbean, okay? It exists in one form or another uh, in, uh, in various tribal uh, situations in West Africa, uh, among the Bantu people in particular, and again, even in the, the Caribbean in some cases as well. And Obeya is very similar in many regards to, um, you know, what people recognize as voodoo or hoodoo in modern cases. So uh, it incorporates fetishes, like what you see here, right? The image of an individual that might be decorated with feathers or something. Um, the use of, you know, ceremonial dolls that could be used to bless or curse people um, and, and so forth. And again, all of this fits very firmly in, under the, the category of witchcraft in the mind of, of someone, especially who might be a Puritan, okay, during this time period. So all of this would have had to have been practiced in secret and continued to be practiced in many ways, all the way well through um, the end of the Civil War. Okay? And eventually, of course, we know that women do gain more rights. Okay? This kind of goes without saying, um, but by very few uh, fits and starts. Okay? Um, protection from physical abuse, again, is one of the only real uh, benefits that women do end up gaining. But Again, at the hands of the law, as we see here with things like the scold's bridle, cruelty doesn't really know any boundaries. Okay. And divorces are granted, again, in rare instances, but mostly only when very overt violence is actually incorporated. Now, we haven't really talked about the southern colonies all that much so far. Um, the the entire economy of the South and social strata and, and so forth is very distinct when compared to the North, okay? Um, again, social distinctions in particular are much more visible. Uh, life in the North is relatively uh, homogenous in terms of how people are able to kind of live and get along, okay? They're, most people are kind of on the same social level uh, for the most part. In the South, it's very easy to tell who has a lot of money and who does not, 
Okay, and this is a, a trait that continues well into um, the, the period of the antebellum South and even into the period uh, after the Civil War when Reconstruction is, is occurring. Uh, most landowners in the South become very, very wealthy, specifically due to slavery. Okay, slavery is uh, what causes people to gain so much money, uh, not only because of the slaves themselves, but simply because of the fact that the slaves, the more slaves you have, the more people you have working the fields, the more you're able to plant and harvest and sell at market. Okay? Um, and again, the, the idea of having more slaves as a status symbol, again, is essentially relegating people to the level of livestock. Okay? And it's exactly what it amounts to here. Uh, the wealthy individuals in the South are the ones who dominate the legislatures. Okay? So any kind of wealthy individual is going to end up uh, holding some kind of a, a local office of some kind, right? The, perhaps the head of a church, perhaps a, a governorship, um, perhaps a, uh, a local judge or magistrate or something along those lines. They can afford luxury goods. They can build mansions, right? They rely on all kinds of um, imports coming in from England. And the staple crops that exist, the term staple crop just means uh, something that is the most profitable. It's something, uh, the staple of an individual's diet, for example, is something that keeps them going, something that they eat regularly. So a staple crop in this case is something that's also referred to as a cash crop. Um, and it's typically not something that's edible. Okay? It's typically something that is not grown for consumption, but grown specifically to sell at market. Okay. And of course, as we know already, tobacco is the primary one at this point. Um, in Virginia and in Maryland in particular, tobacco uh, gains quite a bit of popularity, primarily because of the, um, the climate and the environment. Uh, it's uh, perfectly hospitable for the tobacco plant to grow. Right? Tobacco needs very high humidity uh, and so forth, and the ground has to have a certain uh, chemical consistency to be able to do it. Um, the further south you go, though, of course, the humidity rises, as we know, the ground becomes much more moist. And so crops like rice, for instance, can be grown uh, in places like South Carolina and Georgia, where you have more swamplands. And the further south you go into places uh, like Louisiana, which eventually comes into uh, play here, it hasn't yet. Uh, but at this point in the Caribbean, and even in some places like Georgia, you might be able to import sugar cane. Okay? And sugar cane has to have a very, very um, high humidity to be able to grow. Okay? And as I've already said, cotton has not come into the picture yet. Okay? Cotton is what is so heavily associated with the South and with slavery and with this type of economy. But cotton doesn't really come into the picture until we get to the War of 1812. Um, in its place, though, during this time period, the other primary cash crop is indigo. Okay? And indigo is, uh, of course, a, a violet-colored plant, right, a flower, that once uh, it's distilled, once it's actually uh, processed, it can be used as a dye, okay? to be used to dye clothing, cloth, etc., and becomes very lucrative in that regard. Okay? If you grow multiple indigo plants, right, people can have very fashionable and colorful clothing. And most of the commoners living in the South end up building cabins with some kind of a brick or a stone foundation, um, you know, something that they can live in. And, um, you know, they, they might own a slave or two or they might not. Again, slavery during this time period was not as widespread as what we see in the 19th century. Okay? And even in the 19th century, not everybody in the South owned a slave. Okay? So, um, and once we get to those chapters, we'll, we'll start to see more uh, specific demographics of that. Um, but a typical commoner's cabin during this time period would have been a mixture of wattle and daub, is what it's called. Uh, wattle and daub is basically mud, sand, and straw uh, uh, mixed together to create a mortar of some kind that would go around um, kind of the, the framework that you see here. And wattle and daub is, uh, it's, you know, effective enough as insulation, but it's also kind of brittle. Okay, so if you, you know, put enough force behind it, you would very easily be able to punch a hole in the wall. Um, but you'd also have wooden stakes uh, used as a framework, and you would have a thatched roof made of straw like this. Okay, so it's not, um, you know, not meant to last forever. You would have to eventually replace the thatch to prevent mold and, and that sort of thing, to prevent it from falling apart. So this would require constant maintenance to be able to, um, to keep it up. 
Now, in the north, when we get into places like New England in particular, and even in some cases in the middle colonies, you would end up with a township. Okay, and a township looks something along these lines. Okay, if you ever look at um, a, like a New England postcard or something, right, you typically get this kind of an image. Okay, um, the the center of a township in New England would have been a church. Okay, or a a uh, church slash meeting house, like you would see here, uh, kind of in the top center. It's usually the biggest uh, building in the town. It's usually the one that is uh, centrally located. Um, and most of the taxes in the region are collected to support the church. Okay, this is, again, well before the separation of church and state. Uh, so church and state are very firmly uh, one and the same here. Okay, Quite often, um, the leaders of a, a church would also be local magistrates in, in a township like this. Okay. Uh, all townsfolk, again, just like what we saw in England before people began to you know, depart, um, all townsfolk are required by law to attend services twice a week. Okay, So this would be on usually, typically, again, on Sunday, uh, perhaps Wednesday or Friday, depending on what denomination it is you're looking at. Okay, So you would have to attend biweekly services if you didn't, Right, and you're not just you know deathly ill or something like that. You could face a fine. You could be put into the stocks, which you see here in the very center of town, right by this little well where all the sheep are. And the stocks, of course, if you've ever seen any kind of you know medieval film or images or depictions, a stocks are are basically like um uh, like a yoke you would see put on a, a, a team of cattle or something, right? It's a, a place you would stick your head through a hole, your hands through holes, and a lid would be placed down on top of it and locked in place, where you would be forced to stand there bent over, locked in place for however long, right? Perhaps for a day, perhaps for a couple of days, right? Um, and people would, you know, throw food at you, would throw, you know, rocks or whatever at you. Uh, you would be, it's a, a public shaming, that's what it amounts to. And of course, we already know the Puritans themselves uh, dominate most of these New England townships, and they're very, very theocratic, right? They believe that uh, all of their laws, all of their uh, due process uh, is all directly related to their religious beliefs. Okay? They believe that God has the final say in all this. Um, and there is no real sense of democracy here, okay? Even though uh, some branch offs of the Puritan movement, like the Congregationalists, are slightly more democratic. Uh, the will of the people is not really brought into the mix here. Okay? Uh, most communities in this case are led by ministers and or magistrates. Uh, the magistrate is just somebody who is the um, you know, kind of the sayer of the law, so to speak, or the you know, a judge type figure, a sheriff, a judge, judge, jury, and executioner almost all in one. Okay? Um, land grants are typically given to a collective congregation, okay, so not very dissimilar to what we saw, um, you know, with the, the groups that would actually pool their resources and come over the joint stock companies, okay. Uh, the land is supposed to be distributed equitably, so, okay, so uh, each family would typically get the same amount of land, supposed to anyway. If you had a larger family, though, and or you had a higher social status, if you had more money, in this case, um, and you made a bigger investment, you would get more land. Okay, so there are certain contingencies put in place uh, for people who had a higher status. Okay, so it's not fully equitable here. Okay, it's not a complete um, religious utopia where everyone has the exact same benefits. Uh, common areas and woodlands are considered to be public property. Okay, so you would have uh, this open common era or common area here, kind of where this well and the stocks are, this would have been almost like a, a public park, and you would be allowed to graze your sheep here if you have some, uh, just like you see here. Uh, any woodlands in the area are all public property, so uh, no one can really claim ownership to them, in other words. And of course, all the other buildings that you see in this particular um, image here are fairly accurate. Okay, you would see uh, a minister's house here right next to the church, typically one of the bigger houses in the vicinity. Uh, all in the background here, you see some other houses, you see fields where um, people who own land are actually growing things. Uh, you would have a general store perhaps right here, kind of near the common area. You have a school over here, you'd usually only have one school. Uh, and the school itself would typically be operated um, by the church and or the local magistrate. Okay, You would have uh, 
usually one teacher teaching everyone of every um, what would be considered a modern grade level. So uh, in, in other words, you don't have one, you don't have different um, grade levels here. Okay, everybody would have been taught the same thing. Uh, here at the bottom, of course, you see other little um, property or um, proprietary owners. So you have a cooper here who was a barrel maker, a shoemaker, a blacksmith's forge. Uh, you have a mill down here by a stream being operated, right, grinding grain or something along those lines. Um, and over on the right-hand side, you have an inn. Okay, so uh, and an inn typically has uh, perhaps a, a bar. Um, at this point in time, in, in a township, that would probably be a very rare thing. Okay, people try to outlaw drinking and gambling and so forth there. But um, but in most instances, this is what you would typically see in a township. Now, when it comes to dwellings and the daily life of an individual living in the colonial area uh, era, I should say. Uh, this house that you see in the background here, by the way, is a, a house that does survive from colonial times. So you can see there were very large, uh, meant to accommodate large families. Um, first people who came to New England, of course, didn't have uh, resources readily available to build large houses like what you see, though. Okay? Many of them were forced to live in tents. Uh, caves, if they could find them, uh, cabins with what little they were able to build. Um, and eventually, of course, wood frame houses with pitch and or thatched roofs like what you see in the background are typically what people would end up living in in the long run. Okay, that was the, the goal was to be able to build something that was more sustainable, uh, that still needed maintenance on a regular basis, but was, was a little bit more permanent. Um, most homes uh, were typically uh, centered and supported by a stone or brick fireplace like what you see here so you see the chimney goes directly down through the center of the house here and it acts kind of as the um, the support beam for the entire house okay uh, so it goes directly up through the top level and could potentially heat a second level the interiors of course are plastered they're whitewashed um, typically with maybe a few decorations here and there but not a whole lot okay again these are still puritan households so you wouldn't see a whole lot of images or paintings or anything like that you might see a family portrait if you are a wealthy family who can afford it um or you might even see a cross of some kind hanging on a wall somewhere but you wouldn't see graven images you wouldn't see statues or shrines or anything like that necessarily the main room on the ground floor is uh, the primary living space, okay, the living room. Okay, this is where we get the term living room. Okay, it's usually the largest room in the house where everyone congregates at some point. The dining table is usually located in this room, and this is kind of what the dining table would have looked like. It looks more like a picnic bench. And the dining table here is referred to as the board. Okay, board is where everybody sits and eats. And the husband is usually the only individual who gets a chair. Okay? Um, other individuals might kneel on cushions, or perhaps they might make a, a bench of some kind for everyone else to sit on. But the husband is the only one who really gets his own seat. Okay? Um, and this is where the term the chairman comes from. Okay? You've heard the term chairman of the board. That's where this comes from. Okay? The chairman of the board is the person with the most authority who sits at the head of the table in his own chair. Um, typically, people would eat with wooden spoons or with their hands, depending on what they're eating, right? Typically, the, the food is a stew of some kind, so a wooden spoon is really what you would have. Uh, forks don't really get introduced until the 18th century, okay? So when it comes to roasted meats or something along those lines, if people are doing something like that, they would have to eat it with their hands. Um, and a typical meal would look something like this, okay? You would have corn, boiled meat, and vegetables. Uh, put together in a stew pot like this, and to drink you would have uh, some kind of alcohol, beer, cider, rum if it's made or imported or can be purchased. Okay, rum is made from molasses um, or milk, right? If you choose to drink that instead, and uh, the stew that you see here would have been something that was necessarily um, eaten as leftovers on a regular basis, okay? It would have been essentially left on to simmer almost at all times, um, and the pot itself would never actually be cleaned out, okay? People would just constantly add new ingredients to this, and this was called a perpetual stew, okay? Uh, as disgusting as it sounds, right? And of course, over time, meat can gradually begin to 
um, spoil. It can lead to people getting sick if they're not careful. Um, so, but uh, this was kind of the, the common thing, right? You didn't want to waste anything. Okay, so perpetual stew is kind of the uh, the the everyday meal. Now, the economy of New England is different, of course, than what we see from the South. Okay. Um, the growing season in New England, for example, is very, very short and also really difficult, in particular because of the weather, um, because it's uh, it gets cold a lot quicker. Uh, there is a, a, a little bit more of a rainier season that ends up happening up there, uh, and the soil is very hard and very rocky. Again, it's, it's closer to the coastline um, and, uh, again, not very hospitable to, to planting much. Um, a few small grains can be grown in the area. Wheat, barley, and oats were the most common. Okay? Uh, and of course, animal husbandry was practiced just about anywhere. So you could raise cattle, pigs, or sheep. Um, the largest portion of the New England economy, though, is the maritime industry, okay? having to do with sailing, with um, getting into trade and so forth, uh, fishing uh, for codfish, whaling. Okay, Whaling became a very, very... Uh, lucrative form of business here. You would have blubber that would be made uh, into oil, right, from whales. And uh, this item that you see here called ambergris. Okay, ambergris is actually made from uh, from whales itself too. Okay, from uh, typically I believe from whale feces. Actually, <laughs> as disgusting as it sounds, uh, it's kind of a waxy substance that can be um, processed and was actually used for a long time to make perfume. Um, shipbuilding, of course, is another very common industry. There's uh, quite a few trees still in New England at this point, so people would be able to process multiple trees to build a ship. Um, pine and oak trees were in uh, you know, vast abundance in the region during the period. Um, and American ships at this point were considered to be high quality because of the readily available resources that were there and were fa fairly cheap to make, too, because there was so much of it. But it would take approximately 2,000 trees to make a very large ship. Okay, so this was not a, uh, um, you know, it, it certainly had an impact on the ecology. And of course, trade, as we've already said, is kind of the, the cornerstone for this type of society. Um, the balance between New England and the South in terms of the economies and how the two relate to one another uh, was relatively unbalanced, though, okay, because the, the South is where most of the agriculture is taking place, um, and it would actually have more exports, but more of the imports would come in through New England. Okay, um, After 1660, England actually begins taxing most of the imports that come into the colonies, um, quite simply because the New England economy was not as um, lucrative as the southern one was. Okay? So fish, flour, wheat, uh, any kind of meat coming over from um, from the region was actually um, was actually taxed by England. And again, there's fewer cash crops available for export uh, in New England. So because there's little to grow, right, the South gains more and more wealth compared to the North. Okay? So the North ends up struggling uh, until we get into the Industrial Revolution. And again, raw materials are in much higher demand in England as well. So um, that's really what becomes the um, the primary source of exports for New England, right, is uh, the timber, logging industry, um, fur trapping, and that sort of thing, things that can be processed in England. Um, and when it comes to uh, slavery in particular, um, considering especially in the South and in some cases in the northern colonies and the middle colonies, uh, we have a situation that we refer to as a triangular trade. Okay. And basically what this amounts to is uh, kind of a chain of things that are traded in a triangular pattern uh, in a constant cycle. Okay. So beginning in New England, right? New England might process molasses, which is like a sugary, syrupy substance, process it, distill it, and turn it into rum. Okay. Rum then gets sent to West Africa, where it is traded with local tribes uh, for slaves. Okay. Slaves would be then sent to the West Indies, where they would be traded for molasses, okay? And then the molasses would be sent back to New England, okay, where it would then be processed into rum, and the whole cycle begins again. Okay? So this is kind of how 
um, how New England ends up engaging more in the slave trade, okay? Whether it does it actively or passively, okay? Um, but this is kind of how it ends up uh, spiraling a little bit more. Now, something we've been kind of building up to here in our discussion with regard to women and religion in particular is the most infamous uh, instance in American history concerning witchcraft, and that is the Salem Witch Trials. Okay. It takes place between 1691 and 1692. Um, when it comes to the mindset concerning witchcraft during this time period, um, this is a, a very long and drawn out thing that I'll try to simplify as much as I can, but um, witchcraft has its origins in popular imagination going back well into the Middle Ages, okay? People began to uh, associate um, practices in folk uh, herbology, folk magic, um, stuff that might have been handed down from pre-Christian traditions uh, as being something associated with the devil, okay? And a lot of this has to do with the introduction of Christianity and the more dualistic mindset that goes with it, okay? Basically, an us versus them mentality, okay? If everything that you're doing doesn't firmly fall under the auspices of Christianity and what is allowed, then by default, it allies with the devil, okay? So outdated, outmoded practices of the time period uh, concerning, you know, again, herbology, concerning divination, magical practices, even if it's something that's fairly innocuous, um, mixing an herb to uh, help someone bring a fever down, um, making some kind of a love charm or something along those lines, can be very easily um, misinterpreted as something uh, sinister in the minds especially of Puritans during this time period. And the Puritans were the ones who engaged in the Salem witch trials in particular. Now, fast forwarding a little bit to the year 1486, okay, we have to kind of go back in time a little bit here for this, um, the publication of a document called the Malleus Maleficarum, okay, or the Malleus Maleficarum, however you want to pronounce it. This uh, is a Latin phrase that literally translates to the witch's hammer, okay, and this is a um, a church-sponsored, Catholic church-sponsored document that endorses the extermination and execution of people accused of witchcraft, okay? And this becomes kind of the foundational document for, um, for witchcraft trials in Europe thereafter, okay? Um, and this has its origins in biblical precedent, again, like many things during the with a, an Old Testament um, phrase that comes from, uh, I believe it's from the book of Numbers. This is where we, or the book of Leviticus, I beg your pardon. It's where we have uh, the law of Moses being handed down. And it's actually part of a mistranslation like many other things are uh, with, with Old Testament documents here. Um, the, the phrase in the King James Bible says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Okay, it's basically, uh, an imperative instruction to anybody who is going to practice um, a Judeo-Christian religion, okay? Um, the original Hebrew translation of it, though, is you shall not suffer a poisoner to live, okay? So the term poisoner and witch were considered to be interchangeable when it came to the translation. And again, could be considered a mistranslation or could be considered some kind of a um, uh, a, a parallel phraseology, okay? So again, for one reason or another, it gets blown out of proportion here, okay? So with the publication of the Malleus Maleficarum, um, church institutions in particular began targeting individuals for witchcraft because folk practices, folk magic, um, continues on in many parts of Central and Western Europe and Northern Europe during this time period. Um, whether or not these can be attributed directly to pagan practices is something that has become a very big uh, topic in, um, in historical studies for quite a long time. Um, there was a, a, a woman who published a series of works, uh, her, her name was Margaret Murray, who came up with the theory that there was a secret witchcraft cult that was able to uh, live in secret and survive Christianity for many hundreds of years and that the people who were actually uh, targeted for witchcraft and executed during this little time period here were somehow members of the secret cult, cult secret organization. 
Um, most historians believe that that is a little bit of a flight of fancy, that most of the time these women were actually very falsely accused. And if they were taking part in some kind of you know, traditional folk magic or healing or something like that, um, it was certainly not in uh, certainly not in the context that people put it into. Um, but you know, by and large, this is something that is um, still leaves people scratching their heads in terms of the um, the actual truth behind it. Okay. Now, once we get to the deck or the the century or so, half a century, give or take, from 1560 to 1630. Okay. It's estimated that there are somewhere between 40,000 and 50,000 separate witch burnings that take place across Europe. Okay. Um, and in particular, once we get into the reigns of uh, you know, the time period when we have the, the Protestant Reformation, people are very easily uh, accusing one another of all kinds of things, all kinds of atrocities, in some cases allying with the devil and so forth. So it provides a little bit of context and background for that. Um, and even certain monarchs, right? Once we get into individuals like, uh, you know, Queen Mary the first, Queen James the first, right? Anybody who is eager to um, target people for execution, right? It's very easy to lump them in with witchcraft, okay? And really in places in Central Europe, um, the German principalities is really where a lot of the, um, the you know, pre-modern witchcraft uh, proceedings actually take place. Okay, there are tons and tons of studies that you can look at with regard to this, where people, uh, who, men, women, children, uh, livestock, pets, are all targeted for for some kind of uh, satanic uh, witchcraft of some kind. And there's a another big distinction to to take into account here too. Uh, not to be too long winded about any of this, but uh, the distinction between satanic witchcraft and traditional um, pagan practices or pagan witchcraft. It's two very distinct things, okay? Um, but uh, again, most of the people during this time period were very eager to lump everything together and accuse people of satanic witchcraft, right? Assigning uh, some kind of covenant with the devil, sacrificing people, uh, hexing people, causing illness, causing crops to fail, um, you know, all kinds of uh, misfortunes and so forth. Okay. So people were targeted in Europe primarily for this uh, before the Salem witch trials ever actually take place. And the form of execution used in Europe primarily was burning people at the stake. Okay. Uh, it, it changes once we get to the Salem witch trials and the Americans. Hanging was actually the most common one used then. Um, but witch burnings become a, a very popular thing used. Um, and this is when we start to see you know, people coming into this idea of what a stereotypical witch looks like, right? An old hag with warts on her nose, flying around on a broomstick, um, or perhaps even a young maiden, uh, fully nude, practicing uh, some kind of concordance with the devil, some, something like this. So most of what we have from the popular imagination of a witch has its origins during this time period, and most of it is simply the imagination, something blown out of proportion. Okay, so for the actual start of the Salem witch trials here, it begins in 1691 with a woman named Tituba. Okay, and Tituba is, it, Tituba is a slave woman from Barbados um, who is uh, a, a servant woman living uh, under a local uh, priest, okay, or, or a local magistrate in, uh, in Salem, okay, in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And she is accused of practicing witchcraft uh, by a, a couple of local girls who happen to be uh, the daughters of her master. Okay? And these girls uh, come to Tituba and like to watch her, uh, you know, practice. Perhaps it's herbology. Perhaps it's it's some form of divination. You know, cracking an egg to determine what is going to happen in the future, or something along those lines. Something fairly innocuous. Okay. And these girls. Um, we don't really know the uh, the extent of you know their activities here. We don't know their their motivation. I guess is the best way to put it. Um, but for some reason, these girls begin to act strangely after they see Tituba performing these little things in secret. Perhaps they watch her do it out in the open. Perhaps they watch her do it from private. Um, they begin acting erratically. Okay, the girls start to behave as if they are being uh, hexed. Right? They might start twitching all over, they might start screaming or crying, 
um, they might start acting like they're being pinched or something along those lines. Um, they're, they're acting like they're being afflicted by something unseen. And of course, to, to a Puritan society, they would look at this as being significant, okay? Not necessarily as children being children or trying to um, gain attention from adults or whatever, if that is in fact the case, but they would actually look at this as these girls being afflicted by demonic forces. And the girls immediately turn around and point to Tichiba as being the one uh, instigating all this. Now, the Reverend Samuel Paris is the man who is um, Tichiba's owner at this point. He's the father of the two girls. And he is the one who decides he is going to beat Tichiba physically until she confesses to practicing witchcraft. And again, Tichiba is from Barbados. This could be her practicing her own native religion. Okay, we don't know the full extent of it because it's been so tainted by Puritan ideas. Okay. Um, in the long term, over the course of the next year, uh, 150 men, women, and children are eventually accused and jailed for witchcraft practices in Salem. Okay, um, and in many cases, what this really amounts to is people behaving the way that the young girls are behaving and suddenly turning around and accusing people who might be neighbors, who might be uh, enemies, might be family members, um, people that they might want to see suffer, right? People who might have a motive to do this um, and accusing people falsely or otherwise, right? And uh, again, most of the people who are accused here are women, right? Um, one particular individual here who is a male who is accused is a man named Giles Corey, okay? And rather than being hanged, he is actually pressed to death, okay? This is a, an artist's rendering of this, as horrific as it is. Uh, Giles Corey is actually uh, placed under a large door or a board here, and um, boulders are actually placed on top of it until he is crushed to death, okay? And he never confesses to witchcraft, Okay, to practicing it, most women were actually tortured until they confessed, then they were executed. Okay? And even if they didn't confess, quite often they were executed anyway. Okay? So this was a catch-22. There was no good way out of this. Um, uh, and Giles Corey uh, allegedly said humorously in the midst of all this, add more weight, right? put more weight on top of it, I'll never confess. Okay? Um, and various animals were also accused of being witches' familiars here. Okay? And a familiar in, in terms of witchcraft uh, is supposed to be an animal that is a source of magical power, okay? Uh, perhaps an animal that acts as a, a servant of some kind to the witch, okay? Uh, and again, this has different varying definitions depending on different forms of witchcraft. Again, if it's if it's satanic witchcraft, it's allegedly a demonic entity that takes the form of an animal and is a demonic servant. If it's a traditional witchcraft, then it's an animal that is somehow sent by the gods to be uh, a, um, you know, some kind of a help made of some sort. Again, has all kinds of different definitions here. Uh, and some animals were actually executed, okay? There were pigs who were hanged during this time period because they were allegedly witches' familiars. Cats were killed by the dozens, right? These types of things. Um, and incidentally, when it comes to uh, motivation and so forth, anybody who was convicted of witchcraft and who confessed, if they had property of any kind, it went to the local government. Okay, so again, speaking to motivation here, if there was an individual who was perhaps, um, you know, not necessarily well liked by the community, okay, or someone who was perhaps a wealthy widow who uh, was, you know, not sharing her wealth with people or people, you know, through greedy purposes or whatever, uh, were after the money, right, all someone had to do was accuse her of witchcraft. And if they tortured her long enough and she confessed, she would be executed and all of her property would then go to the local government, perhaps be distributed, okay? So again, there is typically very little to do with magic and actual witchcraft that we know of in terms of theories behind all this, okay? It's typically something politically motivated, greed motivated, something along those lines.
Now, another very influential figure that comes into play here is an individual named Cotton Mather. Okay, and Cotton Mather was a Puritan minister and a lawmaker, and he is the one who acts as a consultant, right, kind of this um, professional uh, witness, so to speak, uh, in the midst of all this, okay, because he allegedly uh, was kind of a witch finder of sorts, right? He was one who worked for um, the British government for a while uh, to kind of act as a consultant on the, uh, you know, on the phenomenon of witchcraft. Uh, he oversaw several witchcraft trials, I believe, back in England before he came to the colonies. Um, and so they believed him to be an expert witness in the midst of all this. And again, he is operating from a Puritan standpoint, okay? He's not looking at you know, folk practices as being innocuous, he's looking at them as being um, active demonic um, practices, okay? So his view is already very, very heavily skewed here. And it takes, um, you know, all the way up until the end of 1692, when these types of accusations begin to really blow out of proportion again, not just the people who actually end up confessing and are actually executed. I believe there are, um, I forget how many, people are actually killed in the process, I believe we see here in a second. Um, but the Massachusetts Bay governor is actually the one who ends up calling a halt to the proceedings and disbanding the court, primarily because his wife is actually accused of this. Okay, so it goes up the chain with people looking to basically shoot down individuals in authority here. Okay? And only three people end up surviving uh, after they're in jail for a long period of time, and one of them is Tichiba, amazingly enough. Uh, she is actually freed in the long run. Uh, but 19, here it is, 19 men and women are uh, either hanged or, in the case of Giles Corey, pressed to death in the course of all this. Um, again, hanging is the most common form of corporal punishment of, um, you know, of actually executing people during the period. Um, we see other instances in Europe, again, with people being burned at the stake. There are no actual instances of that occurring during the Salem Witch Trials. Um, but people being burned to death, people being dunked in water until they either confess and or drown. Okay, that was another common uh, thing that you might see. Uh, again, sometimes people simply being stoned to death, uh, people being crushed like we see with Giles Corey. Right? There's all kinds of different ways that people enacted uh, revenge on this. But you have to keep in mind, regardless of the society that you lived in during this time period, if you were accused of being a witch, um, it would be the equivalent of being accused of being a, um, a sexual predator or a pedophile in today's society. It's a stain that uh, cannot be readily removed and typically is permanent, right? It's something that can easily ruin someone's life during this period. So, um, you know, and, and of course can carry with it, uh, you know, not just ruining your life, but can also mean the end of your life. Okay, so the Salem Witch Trials, there's, there's tons and tons of information out there about this. You can read the actual uh, trial proceedings. You, you can read the questionnaires that were being brought towards some of these women. Uh, but it's a very, very fascinating field regardless. Now, in terms of demographics, I'll very quickly go through this here. Um, the economic and the ethnic mix of the colonies themselves depends, again, on the colonies individually. Okay. Um, the middle colonies in particular were responsible for most of the food exports uh, to plantation colonies. Okay. So anytime there is a, uh, a food export um, that is going into uh, going down to the south, okay, because most of the southern colonies are not really growing food for themselves, they're growing most of the cash crops that are making money. So any food that is coming in from uh, the northern colonies or the middle colonies uh, is being sent through the middle colonies to the south. Okay? And again, this can be any kind of grains, it can be livestock, um, and the middle colonies are the ones that have the most thriving fur trade with natives. Okay? Uh, this is where you would see most of the uh, beaver pelt industry, deer hides, bear uh, hides, and so forth, wolf hides perhaps. Um, and the head right system is employed here as well. Okay, remember the head right uh, is uh, typically anybody who is a landowner. Uh, so you would have a patroon, okay, which is a landlord, who controls land that is farmed by renting families. Okay, and this is something that we see going all the way through um, the period uh, leading up through the antebellum South and even through Reconstruction in some cases. 
um, and even well after that, into uh, what we know as the sharecropping institution. But essentially, you would have a landlord that would own the land, controlled um, uh, controlling land that's being rented by families. Okay, and all facilities uh, on that particular parcel of land belong to the landlord. So, uh, a mill, warehouses, smokehouses, docks uh, are owned by the patroon. Okay, and so even if you have individuals who work at a mill, um, they typically work there because it's owned by the patroon. Um, and a lot of immigrant populations come to uh, the middle colonies more so than anything. This is where we get a lot of uh, Dutch settlers, a lot of German settlers. This is why we get the Pennsylvanian Dutch. Uh, this is why we see a lot of Mennonite groups start to arrive in this region, a lot of Amish groups uh, as, as time progresses. And they typically uh, are looking for land in Pennsylvania uh, over New York because um, there's primarily a lot more religious plurality in Pennsylvania, as we've seen. Um, and it's a little bit more ethnically diverse, again, in terms of Northern European countries. Okay? It's not just the English or just the Dutch. It's the Dutch, the Swedish, and the Finnish uh, before the English actually come there. Okay? So it's several different forms of cultures and uh, religions and so forth. As I said before, the Mennonites uh, end up showing up eventually. Um, they are German Baptists that have beliefs very similar to the Quakers, and even in some cases similar to um, uh, the Amish. Okay, so they uh, they live very simplistic lives. They dress in a similar fashion to the Puritans, but they are a little bit more peaceable and not necessarily as violently fanatic. Um, they are still very fundamentalist in their beliefs, right? Even in modern times, um, there are still Mennonite uh, communities that typically shun, um, you know. Uh, popular culture, right? They shun electricity to a certain extent. Um, they, you know, they allow people to go out into the world to experience it and then make up their minds whether they want to stay there or come back. Okay? Um, and again, there's a very heavy influx of German immigrants during this time period in particular because there are religious wars going on in Europe. Okay? Most of the German immigrants who are coming to the Americas are Protestants trying to get away from persecution. Um, and Germany at this point does not actually exist as a single country yet. Okay, so um, these uh, these people had their own individual cultural identities um, coming from German principalities and so forth, but we refer to them as German. Um, Presbyterians come in from Scotland to Ireland because of um, you know the because of what happened under Charles I. We saw Charles I trying to uh, make Anglicanism a uh, an enforced practice right throughout the United Kingdom, um, and a lot of Presbyterians were actually uh, sent over to Ireland from Scotland to try to make Ireland less Catholic by the British. Okay, so the British are trying to take more and more control over Ireland, um, and over time Presbyterians end up. Uh, coming to the Americas instead. Okay? So this is why we get more Scots-Irish immigrants coming over. And of course, we also had the presence of the Huguenots. Again, Huguenots uh, have had very limited success so far in maintaining their own colonies um, because they've come into contact with the Catholic Spanish. Okay? Remember, the Huguenots are Protestant uh, French, right? Very, very rare instances because France is predominantly Catholic. And of course, we, we're starting to see the beginnings of a lot of uh, race-based and color-based prejudice uh, rear its ugly head in the colonies here. Um, once the late 17th century starts to roll around, slavery is finally legalized in all the colonies. Okay? And this is what allows uh, the door to be opened to it uh, to unfortunately flourish in all of its horror. Uh, race-based slavery was typically justified, again, as I've said before in many instances, by some kind of biblical precedent or religious doctrine. Um, the common narrative among people during this time period, as ridiculous as it is, is that people who were of uh, dark skin came from uh, the descendants of some kind of unsavory biblical character, one or another. Okay? Um, Quite often the narrative was said that these people were the descendants of Cain. Okay? Uh, if you're unfamiliar with um, biblical stories, Cain was allegedly the first murderer. Okay? He was the one of the sons of Adam and Eve who murdered his brother out of jealousy. 
Okay, and God turns around and curses him to work on the land and to till the soil and by the sweat of his brow and to to live in hardship for the rest of his days. Okay, so lines up with the idea of slavery and menial labor. Okay, the other um, individual who was targeted for being a potential ancestor to slaves during this period uh, was Ham, one of the sons of Noah. And this is another instance where Ham is a cursed individual. Okay, after the the great flood allegedly happens, and uh, you know people are able to get off the boat, get on dry land. Uh, Noah gets drunk and gets naked, and Ham, his son, walks in and sees him naked. Okay, and Noah curses him for seeing him naked, and basically says the same thing that we have heard already with regards to Cain, right? You're going to struggle for the rest of your life in the fields, and all of your descendants will be servants to my descendants, and so forth, okay? So trying to um, carry forward some kind of biblical curse uh, on a, a certain group of people, right, um, is, is basically what this amounts to. Okay, so trying to justify it in that regard and say that these people are going to be destined to be slaves and servants for all their days and that the darkness of their skin is somehow allegedly a, a sort of quote-unquote stain on, on who they are. Okay, And this doesn't always necessarily line up just with Christianity. There is such a thing as uh, what we refer to as the Platonic ideal, right? And this has to do more with um, Greek pagan ideologies and that the um, that the inner workings of an individual reflect on their outward appearance. Okay, so this is why we get, um, you know, cartoon characters that you can always tell are the villain because they've got a hooked nose and, you know, twirling their mustache and that kind of thing. Okay, they look evil. Okay, and so this is what people's mindsets were were at the time, right? If you were light skinned, then you had, you know, a pure soul. But if you were dark skinned, then you had a corrupt. Again, it, it, it flies completely in the face of everything that we know when it comes to, you know, um, <laughs> acceptance of other individuals, acceptance of all peoples and all creeds and all everything like that. Um, this this is something that was horrible then, just as it's horrible now. Okay? But people justified it at the time and allowed it to continue. And that's why we have such a horrible history of slavery in the Americas. Um, so again, race-based slavery continues on in this way for a very, very long time. Uh, and again, the English very foolishly continue to associate dark skin with evil, with some sort of savagery, savage instinct, animalistic instinct, uh, with heathenism, with sin, with you name it. Okay, Any, Anything that they can hook onto and use to their own horrible extent, they will do it. Okay, So um, again, there's, there's no excuse for it. Um, and Virginians in particular are the ones who have a, a, you know, a tradition from this particular time period of being a little bit more on the violent spectrum here. Um, they begin to convince themselves that blacks and natives are lazy, treacherous, and stupid, okay? That these people are, um, because they refuse to work in the fields, they refuse to cooperate, that they are somehow minions of Satan and so forth, or some variant thereof, okay? So... Um, and another justification that they attempt to use here, uh, and this again goes back to kind of the ancient beginnings of Christianity, is that um, people were allegedly given a particular station in life, okay, and that this is somehow something that is God ordained. And to try to release someone from a particular station, vis a vis, if you try to free a slave, for example, then you are somehow violating God's will. That God somehow approves of slavery. Okay, um, once we get into the 19th century, we'll even see ministers claiming that God is white. Okay? So this is, and of course, if you see you know, religious depictions even well into the 20th and 21st centuries, quite often you see uh, very whitewashed images of these individuals and deities and so forth. Um, so anyway, this is a long thing that you could very easily get into a discussion on, um, but. This is kind of the, the mindset of individuals during the time. Um, and it's, it's worth mentioning here at the very beginning of all this, slavery was uh, initially conceived as a temporary thing like indentured servitude. Okay? People would be sold into slavery for X number of years and would then be released in time. Okay? Uh, not that that makes it any better by any sense, 
Um, but uh, it shows how much slavery ends up um, degrading even further into um, horrible practices over time. Because eventually, of course, as we know, it becomes a permanent thing. Okay? And individuals born into slavery are not granted freedom immediately. They're automatically born as slaves. The 1660s is when we see the beginnings of slave codes being enacted in the colonies, and uh, variants of this continue well on for the next 200 years. Okay? Uh, and individuals become slaves for life, again, children become slaves for life. Um, and slaves are, you know, uh, stripped of most of the rights. Okay? Most slaves and women during this time period had very similar uh, restrictions placed on them. They're not allowed to serve on juries. They cannot travel without permission or without a sponsor or a, um, you know, uh, uh, an individual to to keep watch over them, right? To make sure they don't run off. Um, and they cannot meet in groups of more than three because that would be considered um, potential sedition, right? That they're plotting against their masters or something. Um, so again, these types of slave codes, when they are actually written. Uh, continue in many cases even well after the Civil War ends and the Emancipation Proclamation goes through, okay? uh, well into the Reconstruction period and into the period we call Jim Crow. Okay? So this doesn't go away very, very quickly. Um, in very rare instances, something called manumission can be achieved, okay? and manumission is when a slave is freed by his or her master, okay? and this is typically done uh, through purchase. Okay? A person can, uh, if they are allowed to keep money in and of themselves, if they can gain control of money, they might be able to purchase their freedom. But this was disallowed in most cases. Okay? Um, and this is still uh, during the transition period to the permanence of slavery. Now, when it comes to colonial slavery, we've already discussed some of the, um, the practices of obtaining slaves and bringing them to the New World. Um, most of the time, the economies and the environments that called for, um, for African slaves were sugar-based economies. Okay? Um, people who worked in the Caribbean were often even transplanted from Caribbean islands into the Deep South to work on uh, sugar cane, cane plantations. Okay? Um, the Portuguese uh, in Brazil were typically the ones who facilitated most of the African slave trade, again, through that triangular trade system that we discussed earlier, uh, exchanging um, molasses and rum for slaves and continuing the cycle that way. And sugar at this particular point in time was a newer commodity. It was something that had only recently been discovered uh, and was considered to be almost as valuable as gold or silver. Okay, so. Uh, Sugarcane plantations were very highly sought after industries. Okay? To be a part of that was to be part of something very valuable. And of course, slavery is a very big portion of that. By the early 18th century, um, there, we start to see more of a decline in indentured servitude. And again, it ends up coming to a complete end by the time we get to the American Revolution. But there is a corresponding rise in African slaves okay, coming to the New World. Um, and there are several different slave trading companies that begin to emerge during this period in competition with one another. Okay? And this uh, allows for more uh, price competition, which means people could afford to purchase slaves, and there uh, becomes a much higher demand for them as a result as well. Okay? So again, it's, it's difficult to speak of people in terms of property and that sort of thing, but this is the, again, this is the mindset from the time. And that's exactly what they were. African slaves were viewed as property. Um, and sometimes on a uh, parallel scale to livestock, and sometimes not even that, um, in order to um, you know, view a slave as such, uh, you would have to be able to you know, uh, exchange them in a certain way. Okay? It, there were instances, for example, where um, a, a proprietor might ask to borrow a slave from a slave owner uh, to, to work in a shop or something like that. Um, sometimes the slave would be able to keep some of the money, and that's how manumission might be able to be achieved. Um, but quite often it was the equivalent of uh, asking to borrow um, you know, something from a neighbor, okay? asking to borrow a cup of sugar or asking to borrow uh, a tool of some kind. Right? That's essentially what a slave was, was a tool. 
Um, and of course, once the Africans were brought to the colonies, they were immediately auctioned off. And this is uh, one rare example I could find um, as, uh, you know, as potentially triggering as it is. I apologize if it is. It's certainly not my intent. Um, but this is a very truthful and accurate representation of um, uh, of an advertisement for for a slave auction. Okay, uh, it says the the name of the ship. Uh, it says there are 250 fine, healthy Negroes who have just arrived from the the Rice Coast and Windward. Um, says that they have all been inspected. None of them have smallpox, right? Uh, and they're being sent to Charlestown, Charleston, South Carolina, to be auctioned off. Okay, so this kind of gives you a sense of how individuals were treated. And again, like livestock, they would be inspected for illness, uh, for potential quote-unquote defects, whether it was an injury, a birth defect, whatever the case may be, anything that would, um, you know, uh, degrade their value at market. Um, again, most often they were forbidden from practicing their own native religions or even from speaking, speaking their own native languages, okay, which makes it virtually impossible for them to communicate. Um, they would be uh, forcefully baptized in, in the Christian faith in most cases um, and would be you know, forced to learn English in order to get by. Um, and again, primarily they're used for manual labor, but used for just about all aspects of the colonial economy, right? Any kind of labor that needs to be done was typically done on the backs of slaves from this point going forward. Um, and the first wave of enslaved Africans, uh, again, as horrific as it sounds, they only lived about five years after arrival, okay? Most of the time because they were simply worked to death, okay? Um, stressed uh, into illness, uh, injured, uh, something along those lines uh, to where uh, dying of heat stroke, whatever the case may be, right? They were quite literally worked to death. Um, by 1750, it's estimated there was almost a quarter of a million slaves living in the colonies already, okay? and this had only been in practice for about 100 years. Um, in some cases, they were uh, relegated to specialized labor. Right? Men might be able to gain uh, a position as an artisan, right? working for a blacksmith, a carpenter, or bricklayer. And women, again, like most women in the colonies, were relegated to household servitude as midwives, as laundresses, uh, women who had knowledge of herbology, of folk practices, might be called upon to be midwives, okay? And, you know, accusations of witchcraft might be overlooked, okay? Um, people have asked in the past about this particular device that you see up here at the top right. Um, this was um, uh, essentially, it's a, it's a collar that goes around a person's neck. Again, it's a way of dehumanizing them further, but it's um, it, these little items on the end of these hooks here are bells, okay? And it's a way of um, potentially keeping track of people to know where they are and or as a means of public shaming, okay? Uh, very similar to the scolds bridal that we saw earlier. Now, of course, we already know that the system of slavery was extremely abusive, and to refer to it as abusive, again, is a very severe understatement. Um, it's a, a human crisis that can only be measured in, um, in, in human lives here. Um, and there was resistance in some regards, okay? Not always did slaves lay down and simply take it. Um, colonial laws did allow whites to be able to brutalize their slaves uh, with abandon, okay, because again, you're you're not treating these people as humans. Uh, you're you're still treating them as property, as objects, or as uh, animals at best, okay. Uh, so once they become property to another individual, that individual allegedly has the right to treat them however they want, okay. Um, shipping them away to the Caribbean is another way of potentially punishing them because the plantations that existed in the Caribbean where sugarcane was were quite often much more brutal than what you might see in the American mainland. Okay. Of course, the, uh, we're getting closer to the equator. Um, the, the environment is typically much more dangerous. There might be poisonous snakes. Um, the, uh, the overseers might be even more brutal. Slave masters might be more stringent. Um, just harsher living conditions all around, okay? So to threaten a slave with shipping them off to the Caribbean uh, was sometimes enough to keep them in check if they attempted to resist in any way. 
1669, Virginia actually goes so far as to declare the accidental death of a slave during a beating to be not a serious crime. Okay, they actually put it into the law books saying that there is, um, you know, actually killing someone, killing a slave is, uh, is not a crime, that someone will not be punished for it. Okay, so this gives slave owners now a license to kill, essentially, okay, to, to treat these people with abandon. Runaway slaves, of course, begin to be advertised in newspapers, and again, this continues well into the 19th century. Okay? Um, and armed rebellions, in some cases, were organized. Okay? Uh, this was a rare event in the early days. We see these happen more and more often uh, the closer we get to emancipation in the 19th century. The Stono Rebellion is one particular instance that occurs in 1739. Okay? This is where we have a group of 20 slaves uh, who in the deep south who ends up killing a white shop owner and they uh, take weapons, they arm themselves, and they march down to Florida and end up killing 25 whites along the way. Okay. Uh, local militia ends up killing the most, uh, most of them, and the rest are eventually uh, captured and um, as horrible as it is, they are actually beheaded uh, as, as a way of making an example of them. Okay, so um, you know, rebellions were very brutally uh, crushed when they actually did occur. Um, and in 1740, there is actually a quote-unquote Negro Act that is passed uh, that uh, basically doubles down on punishments, uh, on oversight, uh, makes overseers, gives them more rights to brutalize people when and where they see fit. And the Northern Slave Society is much more different and, uh, again, it's much more centralized to cities and ports. Um, when it comes to this particular type of environment, again, you, you would have more opportunities for slaves to actually not just engage in manual labor, but again, to potentially be apprenticed to a more, um, uh, I, I guess, a more, um, a, a better craftsman of some kind, right? Not just doing manual labor in a farm setting, okay? You would have someone uh, who is more reputable is the word I'm looking for. Uh, you might be able to find them apprenticed to a silversmith, a blacksmith, right? something along those lines, a cooper, uh, a cobbler, right? Something that if they are allowed to be uh, eventually freed over time, right? Especially in the early days, or, or if they end up achieving manumission of some kind, then they actually have a trade. Again, similar to what we saw with indentured servitude. Again, it's difficult to draw a direct parallel between the two, but um, still in a very similar regard. And when it comes to acts of rebellion in, you know, in slave society, especially in early days and even continuing on into the later days, um, it's usually a small act of some kind, right? Stealing food of some kind to, to feed themselves, give them comfort, breaking a tool perhaps as a sign of rebellion, uh, destroy, you know, destroying crops here and there, faking an illness, uh, and even practicing a native religion in secret, right? Granting themselves some sort of agency and some sort of rebellion against the system that they've been thrust into okay, and from which they may, might not get out of. Okay? All right, so that gives us an idea anyway of uh, some of the uh, forms of life in, in colonial America. Um, we'll continue on talking a little bit more about colonial cities and so forth in the second half.